Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We're going to start off with a few questions, so feel free to raise your hands. Who here is running Kubernetes on the cloud? Don't be shy. A oh. lot of hands. Also, who here is confident that there are no threat actors in their Kubernetes cloud environment? <laughs> Keep your answer in mind. My name is Tav, I'm the DevOps tech lead at Mitiga. And my name is Ariel, and I'm a security researcher at Mitiga. Today, we'll be discussing on performing threat hunting in Kubernetes on the cloud. Let's get started. Why should we run Kubernetes in the cloud? Cloud Platform offers us virtually limitless resources, allowing us to scale our Kubernetes clusters up and down based on demand. Usually, when you're just starting small, it's the easy way to go. No need to worry about all the heavy lifting of setting up your Kubernetes components by yourself. No need to deal with upgrades, patching, and monitoring, as most of this is done for you. All you have to focus on is application development and deployment. All major cloud vendors offer managed Kubernetes services, such as Azure AKS, Google GKE. In this talk, due to time limitation, we'll be focusing on threat hunting specifically in AWS's EKS. But the main concepts we'll be discussing here today are relevant to all cloud vendors. So now that we've set the stage, let's dive into one of the most crucial aspects of performing a cyber investigation, the logs. Generally, the logs are divided into two groups. We have the Kubernetes ecosystem logs and the cloud provider logs, in our case, AWS. In the Kubernetes ecosystem, we have several log streams that are relevant for a cyber investigation. We have the API server log that provide insights into cluster operations and API calls. The scheduler logs and controller manager logs that offer information regarding cluster state and scheduling tactics. The audit log basically documents every action performed on the Kubernetes API server by different principles. And additionally, we have a special log called the authenticator log that provides information for both AWS and Kubernetes and records authentication attempts and access requests made to the Kubernetes API server by AWS's IAM, Identity Management Service. Please take it from here. Now to the cloud provider side. Each cloud provider has its own implementation of three relevant concepts, collecting Kubernetes logs, auditing management actions, and detecting malicious activity. The simple way to collect and analyze Kubernetes logs when we use EKS is using CloudWatch, the AWS monitoring service. The AWS audit log is called CloudRail. CloudRail log contains records about actions that are made by various types of entities. The AWS threat detection service is called GuardDuty. Now, we are going to talk about threat hunting in Kubernetes on cloud. What is threat hunting? Why should we perform it? And how can we do it? Let's start with a simple analogy. Think about a child playing Where's Waldo. When a child opens the book, they don't know where Waldo is hidden. However, they assume he's there and start scanning the page. Similarly, in our field, Sometimes, threat actors succeed in compromising an environment without triggering critical alerts in threat detection services. We believe you should assume there are threat actors in your Kubernetes environment and actively search for them. This proactive approach is called threat handling. By the way, here's Waldo. Mainly, threat hand is divided into three steps. The first step is choose a concrete hypothesis an environment and the threat actor's motivation. For example, an environment can be all your buckets in GCP, and the threat actor's motivation can be to exfiltrate all your sensitive data from these buckets. It's important to understand there are a lot of potential hypotheses, and you should choose the most relevant ones to your organization. The second step is build a list of potential indica indicators of attack that you can identify in the relevant logs. The third step is to take the indicators you found in your environment and investigate them. Let's perform our threat hunt. We have an EKS cluster, and within this cluster, there is a pod with permissions to our sensitive bucket. 
In our hypothesis, we assume there is a threat actor that gained persistent access to our cluster and is using it as an access enabler to the sensitive bucket. It's important to note that in this hypothesis, we focus on the persistence phase and not in the initial access phase. So we assume that the admin user was compromised for a short time somehow, and this is for another threat hunt. What can be relevant indicators of this attack? For this lecture, we chose three interesting ones. The first is persistent access creation to the cluster from an external account, aka the threat actor account. The second is connection to the cluster from an external account. And the third is access the sensitive bucket via the relevant pod, by the threat actor, of course. The first indicator of attack focuses on creating persistent access to the cluster. This means establishing a valid connection to the cluster and being able to authenticate it. In plain Kubernetes, we have two primary methods of authentication. We have service accounts that are managed by Kubernetes and simple users. Managed Kubernetes services offer out-of-the-box OpenID Connect integration with their identity provider. So, for example, in AWS, you can bind an IAM role with Kubernetes RBAC permissions through the EKS API. This feature is called Access Entry. And below, you can see a CLI command of creating an access entry to a Kubernetes cluster. So after you've executed this command, you will be able to authenticate to the cluster using your IAM role. Threat actors can use this feature to create persistent access to our cluster. It's easy to find this activity in CloudTrelog. As you can see, in CloudTrelog, there is a create access entry event name under EKS event source. Under request parameters, you can see the cluster name and also the principal ARN that we want to grant access to. ARN, by the way, stands for Amazon resource name. The principal ARN contains an account ID. If this account ID doesn't appear in the list of your organization's account IDs, and also you aren't familiar with this account ID, you have a really good reason to suspect there is a threat actor in your Kubernetes environment. You'll note that in this lecture, the log examples don't contain all the fields, just the most important ones. So, our threat actor created persistent access successfully to our cluster, and now let's see how we can identify the actual connection to the cluster from an external account. In the relevant logs, there are two ways to identify this activity, in the authenticator log and in the audit log. In the authenticator log, we can see the exact time of the connection, which is a relevant piece of information in cyber investigation, of course. In the audit log, we can see the actions that the external principal made in our cluster. The advantage in this second way regarding connection recognition is the audit log contains the actual source IP, which is also a relevant piece of information in cyber investigation. Until now, our threat actor created persistent access successfully to our cluster and connected to our cluster from an external account. Now, they finally can access the sensitive bucket via the relevant pod. But Wait a minute, how can a pod in a cluster even access an AWS resource? When a pod needs to access a third-party service on the cloud provider side, such as Azure Data Factory or Google Function or Amazon RDS, authentication is required. I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand again if you still use static credentials, because that's a big no-no. Static, also called permanent credentials, are not a secure way of authenticating due to their lack of expiration. Managed Kubernetes services offer us API-based authentication with temporary credential use. So if you're still using static credentials, now is the time to make the switch. This is a short diagram explaining how API-based pod identity works. We have a pod that is connected to a service account that generates a token. Whenever the pod needs to access the third-party service on the cloud provider side, it sends the token to the cloud provider's API server for validation. After it's validated, the cloud provider sends back credentials to the pod. The key point here is that these credentials are temporary and they expire after a certain amount of time depending on the cloud vendor. As you can see below, you have different implementation for this feature on each cloud vendor. Thank you, Stav. Now we understand how the threat actor can use the pod's role to access the sensitive bucket. 
Unfortunately, there is no trivial smoking gun in the logs to identify this activity. But it's a great opportunity to talk about the necessity of anomaly analysis in threat hunting. As we described, in threat hunting, we search for threat actors that succeeded in compromising an envir environment without triggering critical alerts in our threat detection services. Therefore, it's important to search for them wisely using the context we have about our environment. Here you can see a simple example. This graph is based on cloud events. The source entity is the pod's role, the target entity is the bucket, and the events are access events to a bucket like this. In this graph, you can see a pattern of application's behavior. But if you take a deeper look, you can see an anomaly between May 12th to May 17th. In threat hunting, we should take these events and investigate them. What are the source IP and the user agent? Also, we should take a look at the event names and consider if we expect to see them in this context, and so on. Let's summarize our threat hunt. We chose a concrete hypothesis, an EKS cluster, and a threat actor that gained persistence to our cluster and is using it as an access enabler to our sensitive bucket. We built a list of potential indicators of attack and understood how we can find them in the relevant logs. Now what remains is to take the results of the queries and investigate them. So what's next? Tomorrow, you want to start by enabling and collecting all the relevant logs, your Kubernetes logs, and your cloud provider logs. Next week, you want to start getting to know your logs, spend some time exploring them, and finding out what are the relevant fields. And next month, you want to start building your threat hunting strategy. Map out your important clusters, choose the relevant scenarios, and decide on a schedule to perform it. If there is one key takeaway we want you to take from this talk is that it's all about asking the right question. It's not about whether there is or there isn't a threat actor in your Kubernetes environment. It's about where it is. You should assume there are threat actors in your Kubernetes cloud environment and you should actively search for them. Thank you very much. We hope you enjoyed this talk. Feel free to contact us via LinkedIn or email for questions. You have a QR code for a blog we posted earlier this year regarding pod identity. And we hope you'll have a great rest of the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you.